Welcome to another episode of What Happened, the show that explores the farthest reaches of the Outer Rim to excavate all the dusty, embarrassing hollow disks that it has to offer. Now I know this must be the upteenth time we've covered Star Wars and Star Wars related projects on this program, but I assure you that... Wait, what's that? Oh, this is the first, the first time? Yeah, okay, no, come on. You're telling me I haven't talked about this or that? Or like all of these? Hmm? Really? Damn. Maybe it's because everyone has already trashed all the Star Wars stuff that we're all well aware didn't really work out, and that's why I've inadvertently shied away from tackling the galaxy far, far away. Because, yeah, there's already a vast body of work out there. But hey, why not start now? It's not like the war in the stars is ever really gonna stop. Oh man, what? you're just ruining it! The Force Unleashed had humble beginnings as a third-person action game. LucasArts were just feeling things out when suddenly, BAM! God of War slashed into store shelves just as they were starting development. Then, a couple of years later, God of Star Wars! Now, while this force never unleashed the critical accolades that Kratos did, it can't be overstated how incredibly lucrative hacking and or slashing with a lightsaber could really be, selling over 1.5 million copies in its first week and quickly moving past 7 million in less than two years. That's probably not all the HD version though, Force Unleashed was spread over like 10 different platforms or something. While LucasArts had seen various levels of success with previous Star Wars games over the years, from flight sims to racers to FPSs, The Force Unleashed set a new standard, becoming their fastest selling title of all time up to that point. That's why it's so disappointing that The Force Unleashed 2 would end up squandering all that momentum. Review scores came in on the lower end and sales were even lower than the first game, choking out the blockbuster franchise right where it stood. It's a story that can only be told in a slow-moving crawl on a starry backdrop. So gather up your midichlorians and don't drop your saber, it's time to find out what happened to Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2. What a piece of junk! Nah, nah, we're, we're not doing that. As previously stated, the first Force Unleashed was just as big of a blockbuster in the video game space as the films were in the world of cinema. While the gameplay was criticized as a touch repetitive and the overall experience was marred by bugs, critics generally praised the story and the sheer spectacle of the game. It was led by Hayden Blackman, a scribe who had cut his teeth ghostwriting novels and penning fantastical field guides before working on a string of early 2000s Star Wars titles at LucasArts. He served double duty for Force Unleashed, leading the writing team and directing the game as well, and is regarded as the creative head of this little pocket of the Star Wars universe. The game's explosive success would push LucasArts to immediately greenlight a sequel, a sequel that initially had a very different direction, narratively speaking. In an early 2010 interview, Hayden Blackman stated that the team's first inclination was to follow a different character, even going so far as to literally use the words Yoda unleashed in an actual sentence. <laughs> Now, this was a natural place to go, since Starkiller was, spoilers, busy being dead at the end of the first game's canonical light side ending. Eventually, however, they stuck with Starkiller and chose to expand his story. Now, despite old Gallant's, I mean Starkiller's motivation and personality being a, a bit milk toast when compared with more interesting characters within Star Wars, <coughs> A lot of marketing muscle had gone into his big debut. If you were playing video games in 2008, you saw him everywhere, even in Soul Calibur 4, which honestly, the farther I get away from it, the more convinced I am that it never actually happened. He had novels and comics written about him too, and with no new films on the horizon, Starkiller was saddled with the heavy mantle of the next big thing. In no uncertain terms, LucasArts proudly declared, True. Whenever Starkiller is not on screen, all the other characters should be asking, 
Where's Starkiller? Hayden was apparently given less than a month to plot the entirety of the second game's narrative structure, as LucasArts were insistent on getting the game out ASAP, wanting to capitalize on their hottest property. This goes double for the story, which amounted to Starkiller's back. Uh, the how, you ask? Well, he's a clone. Ah, everyone enjoys clones. This was meant to play into themes of identity loss and questioning the point of one's own existence, but unfortunately, the plot really didn't have the luxury to explore it very deeply. It was merely a way to get Starkiller back in the shit and on Vader's trail, which, by the way, was easily followed as a carrot was being dangled the entire time. Look, I'm no writing scientist, but that's not especially compelling material. Another narrative issue is that whenever you made a Star Wars, the team needed to check in with Lucasfilm about continuity. Force Unleashed was already treading a fine line with what fans deem was canonically acceptable, but they'd have to push that line even further for the sequel. Hayden Blackman recalled, With The Force Unleashed 2, because we had already established this notion of Darth Vader's secret apprentice, really, it was just sitting down with licensing and saying, this is what we want to do, and getting a few pieces of feedback from them. When you're crafting a story that's so close to established characters and timelines, you inevitably get a little hampered by a lack of creative leeway. It's much harder to craft profound moments when you're told that certain characters and events can't go off the rails. With this time constraint on writing, the game featured a much less ambitious story, mostly consisting of Starkiller moving from point A to point C and killing everything at point B. Force Unleashed 2's levels, unfortunately, were also built very simply and practically, almost to a fault, doubling down on the repetitive elements of the first game, straightforward hallways and a constant string of locked battle arenas. While most sequels concern themselves with offering more complexity, variety, or a longer main quest, those weren't really things you could realistically expect any team to ship in a short span of time. Brian Tibbetts, the game's audio lead, even spoke about having to set up a rapid email system so the sound team could keep up with the game's blistering development speed. There are many different ways to integrate our audio assets, including scripting or placing sound emitters directly inside environment art, and our work was unfortunately blown out many times. This, the email system, helped a lot, especially as the responsible parties didn't realize or intend to blow us out and were more than happy to help resolve the situation. By the time this tool was built though, we had already had to reauthor slash integrate excessively, which is always frustrating. Thankfully, they had strong technical know-how this time around. LucasArts' Ronin engine returned for the sequel, allowing them to build off that base and spend what little time they had on major feedback-based adjustments, like the Force Grip Powers targeting system, enemy AI, as well as full lightsaber-based dismemberment. It's clearer than a dilithium crystal that is, is that is that a Star Wars thing? No? Eh, who cares? That the accelerated time frame is what resulted in the rushed, underbaked experience we got at launch, but just how accelerated are we talking? Well, reportedly, the game was developed in just nine months. Uh, that doesn't compute. Uh, wait, uh... Even with the endless repeating hallways, reused animations, and near identical combat system, how was it possible that the team were even able to achieve that? Well, that would be in part to the helping hand of the world's most famous archaeologist. The cancelled 360 and PS3 versions of Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings was very much linked to The Force Unleashed, both being third-person action games sharing the same back-end technology. Dr. Jones. Again, we see there is nothing you can possess which I cannot take away. While the non-HD versions were finished by external studios, the high-def indie team within LucasArts had apparently been experiencing tech troubles. So the project was canned for perfectly cromulent reasons like timing and finance. The team then got shuffled on to Force Unleashed 2 and were apparently instrumental in getting that game done under such crunchy conditions. As to why it was so hard for them and so easy for the core Force Unleashed team, well, that's a trick question, because it wasn't. In a 2010 interview during a segment about the game's tech side, Blackman explained, 
There is always a trade-off with every tool you use, and they're hard to integrate. Not because it's euphoria, but it's hard to integrate different physics systems together. We were insane and integrated three together, and it almost killed the project a couple of times. When asked the follow-up question, would you ever encourage another studio to try three technologies at once, Blackman's reply was pretty clear. No, if I was told how much I'd have to do to make it work, I don't know if I would take up the offer. A disturbance was felt throughout the galaxy not long after that interview. In mid-2010, months before the game's release, Hayden Blackman suddenly departed LucasArts, having been an employee there for 13 years. While he was the creative lead for the first game, Julio Torres stepped into that role for the sequel, which meant that once the story was set in stone and the game reached a certain point, Hayden's presence wasn't necessarily needed on the project. He remained fairly vague regarding his departure, but the main thrust was that he wanted to look for opportunities elsewhere. Meanwhile, Star Killer's second un unleashing smashed into stores in late October, but things were decidedly less smashy. The game received extremely mixed reviews, with some praising the improved combat, camera, and voice acting, but most seemed to feel that the game's repetitive nature, simplistic storytelling, abrupt ending, and incredibly short five-hour playtime made it the overall inferior experience. Here's some highlights of the lowlights. A desperate cash grab, glorified fan fiction, one of the most underachieving games of the year, and finally, and probably most accurately, feels like it was created out of obligation rather than inspiration. <laughs> oh, I made myself sad. The NPD group reported around 500,000 copies sold in its first two weeks in North America, a massive drop from the game's cool single week 1.5 mil. And unlike Starkiller's first adventure, Tfu 2 didn't seem to enjoy a long tail. I can't even find accurate lifetime numbers for it, which is not a good sign. Steam Spy does have it listed at around 1 million Steam owners for whatever that's worth. Around the same time as the game's launch, Hayden Blackman had established Fearless Studios and expanded upon his departure in a follow-up interview. I had a great time playing in someone else's sandbox, and now it's time to go build my own. The whole point of any independent developer, and the reason most people do it, is that they want more control over the types of games they make, who they make them with, and how they make it. We wanted to try to build a culture where all those things could really come to the fore and reflect our ideals. The reason we left wasn't dissatisfaction with LucasArts or the changes that happened there recently. Why whatever changes did he mean? Well, the year 2010 was a uh, notable one for LucasArts for a variety of reasons, mostly revolving around the fact that it was collapsing internally. You get used to that. There had been a string of high-level departures around Blackman's, including the president, Daryl Rodriguez, who was quickly replaced with former Epic Games higher-up, Paul Megan. The company was changing rapidly, and unfortunately their game output started to slow down. Way down. They went from publishing eight games in 2009, to three in 2010, two in 2011, and so on until the company was purchased, along with all of Lucasfilm in 2012, by that ravenous mousy maw. Force Unleashed 2 would tragically wind up being the last internally made video game they would ever ship. Before all that though, The Force Unleashed 3 had started pre-production, or it was at least being discussed, which was good since the series was ending on a dramatic cliffhanger. Starkiller and current Darth Maul voice actor Sam Witwer lamented the cancellation, explaining one of the possible places it could have gone. At the end of Force Unleashed 2, he cuts off Vader's hand and captures him. I'm not comfortable sharing everything we discussed, but the idea was that this was the biggest mistake ever, and that Vader, like he was toying with Luke, the Force Unleashed 1 and 2 games were all about Vader toying with Starkiller. And at some point, there would be a confrontation where Starkiller's fighting Vader, and everything that worked before suddenly isn't working now. He's like, I cut off your hand, and Vader says, that wasn't my hand. I have no hand. He's no match for this guy. That's a little spoiler for an alternate universe. Hmm, interesting. 
Aside from the recently announced remaster of the Wii version of Tifu, the force has remained firmly leashed ever since. Hayden Blackman never released anything during his time at Fearless, and instead dipped back into comics for a spell before founding another company, Hangar 13, where he directed Mafia 3, geez, which is another game a lot of you have requested. The Force Unleashed series was basically the seventh generation spiritual successor to the Dark Forces slash Jedi Knight games, and the appeal is pretty understandable. People love swinging around their sabers, killing younglings, and grappling with their dark and or light sides. While it's definitely a shame that this saga never got the conclusion it was supposed to, its spirit is at least still alive in games like Jedi Fallen Order, which garnered a lot of goodwill from fans after EA's Battlefront blunders, which I- god damn it, I'm, I'm gonna have to try and do those at some point too. Do or do not. There is no try. If you know of any other galaxy-sized goofs in the realms of video games or movies, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or activate your <laughs> force rage <laughs> down at the Flophouse VIP Patreon and get me to tackle whatever subject you'd like to see in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching!